Upward, how are you this morning? So glad you're here. Glad you came. We're going to have a good time here today. This is the series you've all been waiting for. We're going to study the life of an Old Testament king. Hallelujah. Some of you have never heard a sermon series on the life of Hezekiah. This is your day. (laughs) Here's the question. When you do a sermon series on the life of a king that lived 2,600 years ago, it begs this question, what in the world could that possibly have to do with me? How in the world could a 2,600-year-ago king have anything to say about my life? You might be surprised at the similarity between Hezekiah's day and our day. You know, the world's changed a lot, but in many ways, it hasn't changed at all. People are still the same. I want to talk to you really quick to uh, help you understand what this series might mean to you. I want to talk about the world in Hezekiah's day. Number one, Hezekiah lived in an unstable world. You see, at this time, the kingdom of Israel had been divided into two kingdoms. You had the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. The side of Judah was the blessed side, was the line of David's side, was the line through which Jesus would be born. And Hezekiah was one of the kings of Judah. So Hezekiah lived in a day of tremendous division within his own nation. Sound familiar? Those of you who didn't say anything haven't been on social media or the internet at all lately, but we live in an unstable and divided world. It not only was unstable because of the division, it was unstable because both kingdoms, both divided kingdoms, faced a common enemy, the enemy of Assyria. And the Assyrians were on the prowl all the time to take cities. And the way they would do this is very interesting. The Assyrians were masters at what they call siege warfare. They would basically put a city under siege. And here's how they did it. They would surround the city. They would disrupt the colonial pipeline. And then (laughs) they would come in and take the city while everybody was in line at the gas station and not looking they would take the city away from you. And that's exactly what the Assyrians did. That's how they worked in their day. Not exactly, but I'm stretching it just a little bit. <laughs> just like our day. Essentially, what they would do is they would surround a city in a very similar way. They would put a city under siege by taking away their supply. Uh, grocery st- which there weren't grocery stores. Food would run out. All kind of things would run out. They would basically starve a city to death until they could come in and just overrun those starving people. And there was a constant threat of being conquered by the Assyrians. I mean, it was so bad. I told you Hezekiah was king of Judah. The kingdom of Israel, which was headquartered in Samaria, actually was conquered by the Assyrians while Hezekiah was king. So he literally, they saw their brothers and sisters who had divided from them. They saw Samaria collapse and all those people be taken into captivity. Very much like a day when we see sieges going on around the world, when we see supply lines being cut, when we see division, even in our nation. It's a very, it was a very unstable day, and we live in an unstable, crazy day. Would anybody say we seem to live in a world that's gone a bit crazy in our day? Hezekiah lived in just such a world. Here's another thing about Hezekiah he had absolutely no help from his culture to be a godly man. No help whatsoever. You know, it used to be in our nation that the culture gave you a little bit of help to raise your children. Parents with young children, I pray for y'all. I thought it was tough when, when we had young children. Today, you face a tough world and a tough task to teach your children the principles of God when in reality, our culture does not help us out very much. Hezekiah lived in a culture that did not teach him to be a godly man. In, in Israel's history, from the time of King David and King Solomon, under David and Solomon, they were a united kingdom. But Solomon's son basically had no sense whatsoever, and he divided them out. He, he behaved in such a way that the kingdom split. So from David all the way to the end, when Israel was conquered, and about 150 years later, Judah was conquered, From David to the last conquest of Israel, they had 43 different kings. How many of them do you think were consistently righteous? How many would you say? How many would say, oh, about half? Can I see your hands? How many would say less than half? 
Is anyone going to vote today or not? I'm giving you a chance here. Uh, how many would say less than half? Okay, then you're right. How many would say about a quarter of them? Let me tell you, less than 10% of the kings were consistently righteous. Out of 43, there were only four that were consistently righteous through the course of their life. So he had never seen a king. In fact, the, the last good king before Hezekiah lived and ruled 154 years before Hezekiah. Obviously not in his lifetime. He'd never seen it modeled. The culture did not help him at all become a godly man, much less a godly king. Another sad fact about Hezekiah, and I hope this is not true for you, but I know that many of you it is. Many of you, it's true for you. You're here, you're online. This really happened in your life. Hezekiah had absolutely no help from his father. You would think a godly man like Hezekiah who stood up for what he believed in his generation would have strong godly parents. But we know historically his father, hear me, his father was the absolute worst king that Judah ever had. His father was named Ahaz, and he brought idol worship into the nation of Judah like never before. Ahaz was such a bad king that he actually led Judah into sacrificing their own children to false gods. And I've said this before, and I will doubtlessly say it again. In our nation today, we often sacrifice our own children to the God of sexual pleasure and the God of convenience. Hear me on that today. I'm going to tell you what, we as a church, we're going to stand up and fight for anybody that's being abused. We're going to stand up and fight for anybody that's being marginalized. We're going to stand up for anybody that's not getting justice in their life. But we're also going to stand up for unborn children who many times are not even given the right to live. We stand for that and we will. We will. We're not political. This is a moral stand for life and for human beings that deserve a chance to live. Ahaz allowed this into his nation and in fact even encouraged it. Hezekiah didn't have much of a chance. His father didn't help him. Hezekiah also, like we do, he lived in a pluralistic society. What that means essentially is that everybody determined their own path. Everybody could worship their own God. Everybody was worshiping idols of some sort. Now, I am so glad that in our modern scientific age, and we have so many technological advances that we don't worship idols anymore. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> We're so smart today that we would never bow down before a golden calf, right? We're so smart today, and we have so much science today that we would never create a statue of an eagle and bow down and worship it. In fact, we worship a lot of things that are far less than that. See, idolatry is not creating a statue of an animal and worshiping it in some pagan way. Idolatry is just putting something in your life in God's rightful place. There's a place that God wants to occupy in your life, and it's not a secondary position. There's a place God wants to operate in your life, and it's not as your co-pilot. It's not as your buddy. It's not as your friend, although he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He wants to occupy the place, the throne that's in your heart. He wants to be your Savior and your Lord. And anything you put on the throne of your heart over your kingdom other than God becomes an idol in your life. Hezekiah lived in a day when people worshipped all kind of gods. They had a form of worship that smart people call synchronistic worship. I read a book this week. You know what that means? You can hodgepodge your own religion together. You can put a little bit of Jesus in and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you can just make up your own custom spirituality. Oh boy, doesn't that sound fun? That doesn't sound fun. You can just create your own God. And you can just make Him do what you want Him to do for you and be what you want Him to be. Oh, that's not fun. That's terrible. Because if I make my own God, He's never going to correct me and I'm going to go off a cliff somewhere. 
If I make my own God, he's always going to agree with what I want to do. Hezekiah lived in a pluralistic day when everybody was worshiping everything. He had a lot of strikes against him. But here's what he did. Hezekiah took a stand for the truth. He stood up for what he knew to be true. He stood up for righteousness. 2 Kings 18 verse 3 It says, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He did. He lived his life as David did. Why is that important? David was the ideal king in Israel. God said of David, he is a man after my own heart. That's encouraging to me because I've done some stupid things in my life, and David did some stupid times ten. It's encouraging to me that you can have a lot of blunders. Anybody got blunders in your life? Anybody had more than one? Anybody just been there again and again and again? Um, You can have a whole lot of mistakes in your life, a whole lot of sin in your life, and still come back to God and be a man or be a woman after God's own heart. Some of you need to hear that today. Your failure is not the final word on your life. Let Jesus speak the final word over your life. And when God looked back at David's life, he said, that's a man after my own heart. You want to watch David. Read the life of David. See what David did. See how David lived. See that David even honored Saul when he was a terrible leader. And David was going to take his place. And he still honored him. Got one amen out of that. I'll take what I can get. Watch David. He was the ideal. But hear me. If you were to line all the kings of Israel and Judah up in a line and rank them from best to worst, Hezekiah would be number two. Many Bible scholars call him the second David. He stood up in a crazy, unstable, pluralistic society with zero help from his culture, with zero help from his father, and he did the right thing in the midst of a crazy world. I want to do the right thing while I'm on this earth in the midst of a crazy world. I want to stand up for Jesus. I want to stand up for biblical truth and morality in my world. No matter how crazy the world gets, I want to be a man of God, and I pray you want to be a man and woman of God who does the right thing in a crazy world just like Hezekiah did. Now, here's what he did. He did some unpopular stuff. We're going to have to get comfortable with being unpopular. I don't like that. I like to be liked. I have an unhealthy need to be liked, and I have to deal with that in my life. I want everybody to like me. I like it when you like my post on Facebook. My wife gets mad at me. She said, Andy, you can put up, I burped, and get 400 likes. (laughs) And I like that. I want people to like me. But I'm telling you, I see it growing in our day. We're going to have to get comfortable with this fact. When we stand up for what's true, and when we stand up for what's beautiful, and when we stand up for what's right we are going to tick some people off. And we're going to have some people that walk away from a relationship with us. And I'm just telling you, church, get comfortable. They don't have to like you. They may try to cancel you. (laughs) I'm so afraid. Cancel. You can't cancel the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't cancel a godly man or woman. Yeah, you can kick us off social media. You might be doing us a favor. They can try to cancel you all day long. They can't stop you from loving your neighbor. I'm still going to be going out to breakfast and lunch with people. Most of my ministry is built around food. So I'm going to go out to breakfast and lunch, and I'm going to talk to people about Jesus and love people and let them go on and cancel whatever they can cancel. There's some stuff in me and some stuff in you they can't cancel. They can't stop. Get comfortable with being unpopular. Get comfortable with standing up for what you believe in. That doesn't mean be a jerk about it. It doesn't mean hate people. But be willing to be unpopular for your stand. Hezekiah was. He ticked some people off. Here's what he did. He removed the pagan shrines. He busted up some people's church. He smashed down sacred pillars. Pillars, not pillows. 
pillars. That sounds like how we say it here in Hendersonville. He smashed the sacred pillars and the blankets too. Uh, so sorry. I don't know what in the world I'm doing. Forgive me for that. That was not in my notes at all, at all. <laughs> you people online, you just got to come to North Carolina sometimes and you'll understand it better. Love y'all. Love y'all. He cut down the Asherah poles. I mean, he's messing with pagan religions and he's destroying their places of worship. They would build an idol up on a, on a hillside. Just about every hillside in Judah was covered with a false god. He cut down the groves, it said. He would go, they would go to these ancient groves of trees and put idols in there in those old trees. And Hezekiah just went and cut down all the trees. He said, enough of this. Judah was founded, he said, on God and it'll stay on God. We worship one God, Jehovah, Yahweh. He is our God. And Hezekiah, no other king was willing to do this because no other king was willing to be so unpopular. You know what? Leaders lead in the wrong direction when they care about the power more than they care about the people. When they care about hanging on to office more than they do about doing what's right for the people that they serve. Man, if I ever, stop, if I ever start caring more about my position than I do you, y'all get rid of me. If I ever start doing that and don't love you, you need to find somewhere else to go. Somebody said, okay. Is that a threat out there? I heard that. I heard that. You moving to Florida. Well, you know. <laughs> Don't you call me out. No, I, I do not want to get in an argument with that lady right there. <laughs> Leaders got to love the people. Hezekiah did the right thing, even when it cost him. And if you think he was bold enough to tick off the pagans, let me tell you what, he ticked off the church people too. Oh, it got quiet in here now. I think sometimes I'd rather face the world than some angry church people. Here's what he did. Let's go on. You ready for this one? Now, all the church people, you're going to get a little nervous here. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Boy, he in trouble now. He's messing with stuff that Moses made. Tell you what, there's some pagan idols that need to be destroyed in our culture, but there's also some religious idols that need to come down too. We've been idolizing the wrong thing for too long. Can I get an amen? Now that bronze serpent was a big deal in Israel. The people were dying and God said, here's the solution. This is under Moses. God said the solution is build a bronze serpent, hang it up on a pole. It was a type of Jesus Christ hung up on a cross. And he said, people, when you look at that, you will live. You'll be healed by looking at it. And God did some wonderful things through that bronze serpent. I'm telling you, we should have kept it. You see what Hezekiah is doing? That bronze serpent was paid for by my great-grandpa. There's even a plaque at the bottom dedicating it to him. I learned that in church a long time ago. You put a plaque on something, it's going to be there for a hundred years. We idolize the wrong things. Hezekiah said none of that. Sometimes we idolize the building. You know what this building is? Oh, it's a sacred place. Now I'm going to make some church people mad right now. No, it's not. It's a building. We are the sacred thing. Our hearts is a sacred place. This building, that's just drywall. This carpet is carpet. I bet you the same carpet is in some terrible place somewhere where they're doing bad stuff. The carpet's not sanctified. You need to be. Oh, don't let the kids run around with a drink in the holy place. My goodness me. We got carpet squares now, FYI. You can pull those up when they get stained and put a new one back without hurting anybody's feelings and running any children off. I'd rather have children and have Kool-Aid stains everywhere than have perfect carpet and no kids in church. Come on. Come on. We're not worshiping a building. Hezekiah tore up religious idols too, and some of those have to fall in our nation as well. He was courageous enough to do it. How did he do it? Terrible culture. No help. Terrible father. No help. Pluralistic society. Unstable, divided world. Everybody's scared of the Assyrians all the time. How did Hezekiah do it? Very simply. 
He trusted the Lord. He put all his trust in God. Verse 5 said, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He put his trust in God. I want you to understand, God's looking for some people like Hezekiah in our day who are willing to stand up and do some unpopular things for the name of Jesus Christ and for the kingdom of God. And if you and I are going to be that person, if we're going to be that people as a church, we're going to have to go to a deeper level of trust in God than we ever have before. You hear me. Somebody said this to me years ago, a wise leader. He said, if you need people, you can't lead people. In other words, if I'm dependent on those people's approval in order to lead them in the right direction, I can't lead them. Because sometimes to lead people, you have to do things that are unpopular. And if our nation's ever going to turn around, we're going to have to be willing to stand up and take some fire. We're going to have to be willing to stand up and take some criticism. You know, it's not hard to be criticized today. Very easy task. Say one thing, you'll get criticized. Do anything, you'll get criticized. Preach online, you'll get criticized. You with me? We're going to have to get comfortable with criticism. We're going to have to trust the Lord that we get our approval from Him and not from them. We're going to have to trust the Lord that He approves of what we say and what we do and not worry about the likes or dislikes we get on Facebook. Amen. Hezekiah could only be that kind of person because he fully put put his trust in the Lord. Pop quiz. Everybody ready for a pop quiz? Take out out a piece of paper and a pencil. Did you ever come to class and hear that? Some of y'all, that made you nervous right now. You heard that? Whoa, whoa, a little stress. Uh, Pop quiz. You ready? How many of you know? Raise your hand if you know the official national motto of the United States. We actually do have an official national motto. Motto. How many of you know it? Raise your hand up high. I want you to call it out. One, two, three. Now, some of you cheated. You started talking after you heard the person next to you say it. Uh, we've had all kinds of answers. Some people say one nation under God, which is great. That's from the pledge. Some people, smart people said e pluribus unum, from many, one, you know. And that was the de facto national motto, motto of the United States for a long time. But in uh, 1864, the words, in God we trust, appeared during the Civil War on a two-cent piece. And uh, it still did not become our national motto until 1956. But I'm proud to say, now I know we have people watching from other countries and people all around the world watching. We're so glad. But I'm proud to say that I live in a nation whose motto is, in God we trust. I'm proud to say that when I pull out a dollar bill... It says, in God we trust. Amen? It's still there. Now, some people say, well, America's over. No, it's not. Some people say America's going down. No, it's not. America's done for. No, it's not. It's not done for if I can do anything about it. It's not done for if you can do anything about it. Can I get an amen here today? We're raising up people who are going to be a righteous body who's going to make a difference. Godly people who pray and who live with courage can change their culture. And if you've given up, you might as well go home. I'm sick of hearing how it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and Jesus is going to come back and save us all. I'm glad Jesus is coming back. But I'm not going to see it get worse on my watch, are you? Come on now. Come on now. We raring to go this morning? We can make a difference by living for Jesus in a culture that is a bit crazy. We can make a difference. Praying godly people can influence a culture. And I believe we are the people to do it. And when I say I mean the body of Christ. I'm not going down without a fight, people. Do you hear me? I'm not surrendering and giving up without a fight. I don't mean a civil war. I mean a spiritual war. I mean a war we fight on our knees. I mean a war we fight out in the streets loving people and caring for people and standing up for what's right. I'm tired of people complaining about how bad he is. 
Did God see all this coming? Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? God's never surprised about anything. Did you think he knew in 2021 we'd be in the shape we're in today? Let me ask you a question. Do you think he's put you on this earth to live on this earth for him in this time? Well, if he has, let's stand up and do it. Amen. Let's not sit around and bemoan how bad it is. Let's be the church. Let's be the salt. Let's be the light. Let's make a difference. We can bring hope to our world. Here's what it says. I'm just enjoying this so much I'm going to preach all day long. Verse 7 says, so, since he trusted in God, it says, so, the Lord was with him. Oh, we can pack up and go home on that one right there. If God be for us, who can be against us? God was with him. If God's with you, you got this thing. And then it says, Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. Other versions use the word prosper. Oh, everybody gets scared when preachers talk about prosperity. Oh, be careful. Let's not preach the prosperity gospel. Well, you be careful not to preach the poverty gospel. Last time I checked, when I'm going to bless somebody, I need some money to do it with. Somebody's hungry. There's money needed to buy food. If I'm going to help pay somebody's power bill, I've got to have something to pay with. And I believe when we trust Him, God will prosper His people. Not so we can store up a bunch of stuff and say, look at me. But so we can be radically generous with the community that we live in. Let me tell you something about this body right here that I'm proud of. When Corona hit and the community was suffering, we ran to the community saying, how can we help? That's because God has prospered us and enabled us to witness for Jesus by having something to help with. Amen. There's nothing holy about being broke. But hear me, God doesn't give us prosperity for radical extravagance, but for radical generosity. We got a card just this week. If you don't know it, back at Christmas time, we gave our Christmas offering to pay off people's medical debt in complete secrecy. All they know is that a church did it. That's it. And we wanted it to be a church that loves Jesus. That's what we told them. Paid off 139000 bucks of medical debt at Christmas. We're still getting cards. We got a card this week saying we're a young married couple, just moved to the area. Guy said, my wife lost her job. We lost a huge chunk of our income. At the same time, had a medical emergency, and we couldn't even pay the minimum payments. And we prayed and asked God for a miracle. And sure enough, we get a phone call that God's people have paid our debt in full. Thank you for being God's people. That's because God's prospered us. God has prospered us as we've given. Our church board, some of them are here in the... Let me tell you what your church leadership's doing. We're trying our best to give it all away. Last board meeting, I I told them, I said, I'm going to quit having board meetings. Y'all giving away everything we got. (laughs) Not really. I'm, I'm with it. We've tried to give away the store over the last year. We've tried to give it away. And let me tell you, the more we give, the more generous God is and the more generous you people are. And our emergency fund that we tried to give away has doubled in that time. When you trust God and you give to God, you can't give it away fast enough. You can't bless people because if He can get it through you, He'll get it to you every time. Trust God. Trust Him. He prospered Hezekiah in everything he did. We've got to learn to trust We've got to learn to trust. Here's a word I got for you. You ready for a word? I got 50 seconds to finish this message, but I'm going to take my time and finish it right. Two words. God spoke to me two words for our future. First word is glorious. We've got a glorious future ahead. Second word is uncomfortable. Are you ready to embrace the glorious, uncomfortable future that is this next season for us? Are you ready? Say, preacher, couldn't both words be fun? Sorry. (laughs) Uncomfortable glory is headed your way. If you will embrace it. 
I was talking to a dear pastor, a retired pastor, who's been a just like an apostle to our area for a long time, and he retired from ministry. And I had lunch with him the other day, and he said, he was sharing with me, he said, Andy, I, I had a vision the other day. And uh, this is not a uh, Pentecostal guy by training. We are, we believe in visions, right? We believe in healing, we believe in visions, we believe in prophecy, we believe in all that stuff. He said, God gave me a vision, and I saw God shaking out a mat. He said, God was just shaking it out, and you could just hear it pop. You ever walk out the front door and pick up the welcome mat? I hope you've got a welcome mat. I saw a welcome mat the other day that said, go away. (laughs) Some of you would love to have that, I know. Uh, He said, God was shaking out the welcome mat. He said, what's that? And he said, the Lord showed him that the church is his instrument on earth to welcome people into the kingdom. And that God was shaking the dust out of the church. That God's shaking the idols out of the church. That God's shaking the comfort and complacency out of the church. Because we've got a world out there that's ready to be awakened, ready to be welcomed into the kingdom. And be awakened, by the way. I believe there's an awakening coming through God's church like the world has never seen before. I believe God's doing something in these times. And I'm so excited about it. I hope you are as well. Story, and I'm going to quit. Abilene, Kansas. Many, many years ago in Abilene, Kansas, there was a 13-year-old farm boy who was running home from school, and he fell down and he injured his knee, deeply scratched his knee. Now, he's a tough farm boy, and he didn't worry about it too much. Next morning, he got up, and he was limping a little bit. His knee was hurting. He went on, didn't tell his mother about it. And uh, then on the third day, it was really, really hurting. He got out of bed and he could hardly walk. His mom got a hold of him and said, what's wrong with you? His name was David. said, David, what's wrong with you? David said, Mom, I, my leg's really hurt. She looked at his leg and it was swollen inside his pants to where he had, they had to cut his pants off and cut his shoe off. It was so bad. Tough little boy, didn't want to tell Mom he was hurt. By the time they discovered it, it was so bad, they called the doctor in, and the doctor said, it's so bad, we're going to have to take his leg or he's going to die. Little 13-year-old David said, you're not getting my leg. He talked to his brother Ed. He said, Ed, you stand at the door of my bedroom, and when that doctor comes, if I'm asleep or I'm out, you don't let him in. He said, I'd rather die than them take my leg off. They're not taking my leg. So his brother stood at the door, big old farm boy, and dared the doctor to come by. The doctor said, boy, you're going to regret this. He said, he's going to die if we don't take that leg. Thankfully, David's grandfather was a farmer slash preacher who believed that God still heals the sick. I'm going to tell you, friends, you're going to put me down for the camp of people that believe God still does miracles. Just go ahead and put me in that camp. God's not done doing miracles. He's still moving today. And I'm on that team. I'm glad David's grandfather was. He said, here's what we're going to do. In God, we're going to trust. We're going to trust the Lord here when the doctors can't do anything. They're not going to take his leg. We're going to pray and see God healed him. So Grandpa set up a prayer chain around the bed. Somebody stayed at the bed. They'd take turns praying right at the foot of David's bed. And guess what? The more they prayed, the more that swelling went down. In just a few days, little David got out of that bed with his leg and walked out of that house and went back to doing farm work. In God we trust. Because of a little Kansas family who reached out and believed God to heal their little boy, great things happened. You see, history had something for David. He joined the military and took off in the military. He became a general. In 1944, when the Allied forces stormed the beaches at Normandy and saved the world from a demonic dictator. David was at the head of it and planned the whole thing. Little David. See, I've been fooling you this whole time. His middle name was David. His first name was Dwight, and they called him Ike. He became the 34th president of the United States who knew in God they trusted. And on July 30th, 1956, it was little David, Dwight David Eisenhower, that signed the document that said, the official motto of the United States from this day forward is, in God we trust. And all our currency, all our money will carry the words, in God we trust. Next time you pull out a dollar bill, no, we're talking about God prospering. Next time you pull out a 50 
to give to somebody in need, you look on it and it says, in God we trust. And you remember a little Kansas farm boy who kept his leg because God healed him. Amen. In God we trust. We'll put a graphic up on the screen. It says, in blank, I trust. What's in that blank for you? Money? Job? What's giving you your security? What's your fallback in an impossible situation? What are you trusting in more than anything else? Whatever you put in that blank is really your God. Whatever you put in that blank is really what you worship. Whatever you put in that blank will determine the direction of your life. I'm begging you today. Put God in that blank. Take every problem, every hope, every dream, every struggle, every aspiration and put it in a box and give that box to God. It's yours. You can trust Him. He'll take care of you. You can trust Him to do unpopular things. He'll take care of you when people turn and walk away. Amen. When they try to cancel you, He will honor you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's bow and pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for this day and this opportunity to say yes to you. If you're here in the house today or watching online and you say, Pastor, today I want to say yes to Jesus as the Savior and Lord of my life. Can I see your hand right now? Would you raise it up where I can see it? Thank you so much. God bless you. Those who are watching online, if you're there today and you're saying yes to Jesus, there's a button you can click there. And I invite you to pray and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me and dying for me. Today, I surrender my life to you. And if you'll say yes to Him and by faith believe Him to be the Savior of your life, of your life, He will come in. If you're in this place today and you haven't fully trusted God, just take a moment and say, Lord, I put you in that blank and I truly can say, in God I trust. Make Him the Lord of everything in your life. Amen. If you're ready to get blessed out, lift your hands here. I'm going to speak a blessing over you. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for He will order His angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen to the blessing of God. I now, amen. I commission you go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Share Jesus with your world today. Amen. This week, see you next time. Love you.